This is Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal Magazine, and I'm here with Roger Kimball, the editor of the new Criterion and publisher of Encounter Books, uh, to talk about his new book, The Fortunes of Permanence, Culture and Anarchy in an Age of Amnesia, a book published by St. Augustine's Press, uh, and it's out now. Uh, Roger, welcome. It's great to see you, and thanks for coming in. Hey, Brian. It's great to be with you. Your book carries the title, The Fortunes of Permanence. What do you mean by permanence, and how does that relate to the central argument of your book? My title was ironical in some sense, of course. Uh, we don't think of permanent things as having fortunes. Fortunes are reserved for the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the, the realm of the impermanent. In, impermanent. I, I think that uh, there are really two philosophical influences on this book, Edmund Burke, and Alexis de Tocqueville. They are the, the presiding genius loci of the book. And what I tried to do here was blend them together, blend together Edmund Burke's emphasis on the fragility of culture, the idea that culture is something very difficult of achievement, must be shored up constantly by uh, incessant labor, and is very easily lost. And once lost, very difficult to regain. From Tocqueville, I took what we might call the dialectic of democracy. That is to say, that tension in any democratic society between freedom on the one hand and equality on the other. One of the great insights that Tocqueville had in democracy in America was that any democratic society is always in play between these two demands, between the demand for equality and the demand for freedom. What I think has happened in this country is that dialectic has been upset in recent decades where the demand for equality is trumping the demand for freedom. And what I've tried to do in this book is work out the way in which uh, uh, these two strains of conservative thought, the Burkean strain with its emphasis on institutions, habits of permanence and so on, and the Tocquevillian strain with its dialectic of democracy uh, have worked together to produce this bloody crossroads that Lionel Trilling talked about uh, where culture and politics meet. Roger, you describe your book as an exercise in cultural pathology. Uh, what do you mean by that? And you also sketch out a kind of road to recovery in the book. Could you say a bit about that as well? Ah, uh, well, um, this book is about 350 pages, but it's a very short primer to what's gone wrong with our culture. But if I had to, um, if I had to say the central thing that has gone wrong with the culture, I think I would probably boil it down to we have become a culture of dependency. We have more and more um, given up on the, uh, the prerogatives of freedom in order uh, to enjoy the dubious benefits of a spurious government-led security. Uh, we have more and more uh, given ourselves over to the seductions of a kind of quasi-socialist regime. We're now in a situation in this country, and in the West generally, I believe, where uh, what Hayek described as the road to serfdom has become the road we are traveling down. Uh, Hayek, uh, is, as, as uh, many of your listeners will know, was perhaps one of the 20th century's chief Tocquevillians. He took the, the title, The Road to Serfdom, from Tocqueville. And I think he understood that uh, one of the central problems with extensive government control is that it breeds a psychological change in the people, a change whereby they become habituated to dependency, dependency on the government. And uh, uh, although the book is very wide ranging, uh, it, in, and it, it deals with literary figures as well as theological figures, as well as political figures, at the end of the day, the critical leitmotif is uh, uh, this analysis of the culture of dependency and um, the, 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 the road to recovery, which is to say uh, turning back to the virtues of autonomy, self-dependence, self-reliance. And um, that is a task that can be done politically, spiritually, uh, through culture, but it's a task that uh, it will take us many generations to accomplish. One of the most interesting chapters in your book, Roger, is called What's Wrong with Benevolence? Now, most people would view benevolence as a virtue. What do you mean by saying that there's something wrong with it? Ah, uh, benevolence. What is benevolence? It's a very curious intellectual trait. Um, benevolence 
at bottom is the desire for the happiness rather than the reverse of its object. But here is the critical thing about benevolence. It doesn't really matter whether your benevolent feelings actually result in the happiness of the object. Who are signal benevolent political figures throughout history? Well, Rousseau, Karl Marx, Marx's heirs, Lenin, Stalin, despite the terrible things they did, they had the benevolent, uh, the benevolent purpose of trying to create a more equitable society. And as Stalin said, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. But as George Orwell said, where's the omelet? There, the, the point is that benevolence is a lot like charity. It works, it's, it is a virtue, but it's a virtue that is best practiced, that is successfully practiced, the more local it is. If uh, we make it abstract, if we uh, telescope it so that it's no longer being benevolent to people who are close to us, who stand in some um, uh, recognizable relationship to us as individuals, then more and more it becomes not a virtue, but a vice. It's, it reminds me a little bit of Charles Dickens' character in Bleak House, Mrs. Jellyby, and Dickens spoke about her telescopic philanthropy. She was very, very concerned about what was going wrong with families in Africa, and she campaigned for them tirelessly. Her own family, alas, went around in rags, and she paid no attention to them whatsoever. At the, at the end of the day, feelings of benevolence are just that, feelings of benevolence. They help shore up our own feelings of self-righteousness and smugness, but have very little to say about uh, those objects of, of benevolence who have become part of our moral economy. And think, for example, of one of the chief benevolent institutions in the United States, the welfare state, uh, the great society programs instituted by Lyndon Johnson. These had a benevolent purpose. They were supposed to be part of a war on poverty. And it didn't matter that they actually created more poverty than they, than they cured. So I think that any right-thinking individual, anyone who has real benevolence uh, 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 in mind, will want to be very skeptical about benevolent leaders. So far, the United States has been spared a thoroughly benevolent leader like uh, Vladimir Lenin or Pol Pot or Stalin, but we've had our share of quasi-benevolent leaders, and benevolence, unfortunately, is not only not incompatible with tyranny, it is often its, its most conspicuous handmaiden. You provide fascinating profiles of any number of figures in the book. Hayek, Chesterton, uh, James Burnham, uh, Lizak Kalakowski. What, Roger, in your view, unites these figures uh, um, in your treatment? Well, again, what, my unifying thought in this book really has to do with freedom. These are all, in very different ways, apostles of freedom, uh, whether it's uh, Chesterton with his... Uh, uh, you know, his somewhat idiosyncratic view of uh, modern life in England and, and in the West generally, or Leszek Kolakowski, the great, uh, the great anatomist of, of Marxist, um, uh, what should we call it, uh, malevolent tyranny, uh, what, uh, or James Burnham, the, the great intellectual um, uh, key to national review. He was, said, said William F. Buckley, the, the central intellectual influence on national review in its, in its uh, formative years. Uh, and, and Burnham today is no, best known for his staunch anti-communism. He was another apostle of freedom. What I think unifies all of the figures in, 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 in the book, whether they be literary figures like um, John Buchan, is one, one of the chapters is devoted to John Buchan, uh, or political figures like Hayek or, or uh, Leszek Kolakowski, is these were people who understood uh, the importance of freedom, the importance of what the founders of this country called limited government and the many seductions that would, that would uh, uh, seduce us away from freedom uh, for the sake of a spurious, uh, a spurious uh, security uh, and the blandishments of a socialist state. The problem uh, with socialism, as Margaret Thatcher ob observed, is that sooner or later you run out of other people's money and uh, that's where we are today. Roger, thanks very much for coming by. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. And thank you all for watching. The book is called The Fortunes of Permanence, Culture, and Anarchy in an Age of Amnesia. The author is Roger Kimball. It's out now from St. Augustine's Press, and uh, I encourage everyone to go out and buy a copy. It's a fascinating book.